Kevin. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. So I'm Victor Navasky, the Delaware Court professor here, and I get to introduce Martha Stewart, who needs no introduction. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> but, I, wa I want one. <laughs> but what the hell? She wants one, so I'm going to give her one, whether she wants it or not. And so, she's a businesswoman, a writer, television personality, former fashion model, and like my wife Annie, who's in the fifth row, stockbroker, former stockbroker. As a founder of Martha Stewart Omni Media, she has gained access to a variety of business ventures encompassing publishing, broadcasting, and electronic commerce. She has written too many best-selling books to count, and her syndicated talk show, Martha, was televised internationally. A few years ago, you should forgive me, she famously took a vacation from all of the above. But when she came back, she was more popular than ever. Many people thought her days as a media mogul were over, but by 2011, she was back on the board of directors of Martha Stewart Omni Media, and she became chairman of her namesake company again in 2012. To me, it's wonderful to have Martha Stewart with us today. Her story is an amazing and inspiring one, so let me thank you for being here. And on behalf of Colum the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, welcome you. And I And let me say a word about format. Rather than give a lecture, Martha Stewart has suggested that we begin with a conversation, which will last for approximately, my guess is, an hour. And, and then she has agreed to take questions from the audience. I'm going to ask you a bunch of softball questions and watch out for the Columbia graduate right. students of journalism. <laughs> Uh, and I have promised to wind this up, as we always do, by 9 o'clock at the latest. So. so question number one. But you wanted to say something? No, oh, I'm waiting. Okay, so question number one. What is this really interesting looking magazine all about? What is Marty Stewart all about? So. Well, we started that magazine a little more than 20 years ago, um, and it was it came about uh, because I was uh, writing books, one a, one a year about, and uh, I went to my publisher, Clarkson Potter, which uh, is a division of Random House, which is now a division of Bertelsmann, um, and I, which was a division formerly of Crown, so um, it, very complicated. Um, and I, I said to them, you know, I really would like to uh, do a series of beautiful how-to books. I was very interested in the way things were done. Uh, in and around the home, especially, and they said, "Oh, we don't really, you know, we don't really want books on how to." So then I thought, what format would be uh, appropriate for the how-to that I loved so much—the step-by-step, the do-it-yourself? And I thought, well, a magazine would be. And there was no real, only lifestyle magazine. There were magazines like Good Housekeeping, which was more a service magazine. There was House and Garden, which was really a, a beautiful. Uh, magazine with lots of pictures about other people's houses and gardens. So, um, so I made an outline. I went to Cy Newhouse, um, and I said I gave him my outline, and he thought, "Oh, this is a, a very interesting concept." He gave me an art director um, and uh, the money to create a what we called at that time a prototype uh, and kind of a pilot of a magazine. And I loved it, and I wanted the name Living. I, I had a little conference with my neighbors uh, on Turkey Hill in Westport, Connecticut, and we all sat one Sunday morning at around a breakfast table and tried to think of what would be the good name for this magazine. And everyone, everyone finally agreed on Martha Stewart Living. And I took that name to Cy, and uh, he said, sorry, this is Condé Nast, and it would be Condé Nast Living. And uh, that wasn't, for me, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, it, I wouldn't, I would have gone with it if he had shown a little bit more interest, but he didn't. And uh, he wanted it to be uh, a real, you know, Condé Nast and I would be an editor and blah, blah, blah. So I took it to Rupert Murdoch. And, um, and oh, I, I loved Rupert. I thought he was fantastic. But at the time, unfortunately, he was just about to close many of his media properties in the magazine world. And he said, you know, I mean, take, it to, take it to Time. Maybe they'd be interested in it. So I took it to Time. 
and they, of course, were interested in it, and the, the rest is kind of history. Uh, but I remember the first lunch I had with the editors, they, they sat around and, and we, I was presenting a prototype July issue with July 4th in it and all kinds of good stuff. They said, well, this is so full of information. What, what would you do next July? And I said, oh, I, was, I was shocked that they couldn't understand that there was so much, a limitless quantity of information. So this is a magazine that really devotes the pages to um, living a good life. Um, inspiration, information, how to, good trusted recipes, good trusted content. That's, that's not only inspirational, but also um, really goes to two kinds of people, doers and dreamers. And that's really what it is. Uh, well, that's great. Um, what's your role in the magazine? Do you, do you see every page before it goes to press? Or do, do other people do that? At the, at the time, uh, at the present time, I am no longer editor-in-chief. I'm, I'm known as uh, founder and chief creative officer, I think. That's my title. Um, and um, I have a very good editor at the present time, Eric Pike, who's worked with me almost since the beginning of the magazine. And, uh, and he's, uh, he and I think very much alike in, in terms of content. And they, um, the, the editorial meetings, many, many, many uh, occur without my, my uh, input. But I do look at the magazine before it goes to press. I do look at the, um, at the wall. We have a, a big wall on which every page is pasted up. Right. And, um, and I, will, I will comment. I will try to change. Uh, I will argue. Uh, we do have heated arguments Who about certain things. Who wins the arguments? <laughs> Me, I mean, usually, no, <laughs> I do, but I, no, it doesn't. It's, that's not about that. It's really about um, experience, more about what what uh, what d does and does not really fit into our content wheel. But uh, it's uh, it's an interesting process, and uh, I'm very I'm very happy with the team that we have uh, working on the magazine now. Our um, our we do surveys, a monthly survey uh, now uh, um, online. And uh, the last survey was very, very positive. So I was, I was very pleased with what's, what's happening. Um, great. And, and what about Martha Stewart weddings? Is that, are you as that, deeply involved in that as you are in Martha Well, that's Stewart another weddings? very interesting publication. It's, the, I think, the, probably the most respected of the bride, bridal magazines. Uh, this, by the way, has a circulation of 2.1 million uh, subscribers. Uh, readership of about 11 to 12 million a month. The, it's, a, it's been like that pretty much steadily. That, that we keep it around that 2.1, 2.2 million uh, rate base um, for a very long time. I, when I started, I would have liked it to have been uh, more like National Geographic. I thought, gosh, you know, there, there are at least 20 million people that need this magazine. Uh, at the highest, um, we were up at 2.35, I think and with a readership of about 14 million. Uh, I would love that, but um, uh, to, I would love it to be much bigger than that because the content is, um, is so good. But now that we have Pinterest and we have Instagram and all of that stuff, I'm not quite answering your question about weddings, but um, it's, um, it's really interesting how, how many people see so much of the imagery and the, and the recipes. Google any recipe, it's, it's there. Uh, you can find it. You can find pretty much any recipe from every single issue of this magazine. Same with weddings. And weddings started about 20 years ago. Um, I, I love that magazine, and it's uh, a very inspirational magazine. At the time we started it, there were 2.5 million weddings a year. Uh, and there were, oh, about five weddings magazines, brides magazines. Now there's more bridal content available, both online and in the print. And there's... Um, uh, fewer and fewer weddings every year. And uh, you guys who are not married, you, you shame on you. You should at least get married at least once. I mean, just to go through this stuff. It's really fun. And, um, and learn all about it, because it is a rite of passage, and it's very important. But uh, so many uh, young people are opting out of that process. And, um, but you know that's the way it is. Things change, and uh, in our business, in the media business, the change has come fast and furious. I would say in 20 years, so much has happened. You know that. I mean, you're you're here, embroiled in it all. Trying to keep up, but you were starting to tell me about how you're getting involved in all of the 
so-called new media. W why don't you say a little bit about that? I'm oh, yeah, well, um, that. three years ago, when uh, the digital magazine uh, became possible with help from Adobe, uh, because they created a program for us that would enable us to take the printed page and, and uh, bring it to life online, uh, we created the first living app, uh, Martha Stewart Living App. Uh, we called it Boundless Beauty, the first one. And we were the first lifestyle magazine to go digital. And I was so thrilled with it. We all were. We all spent a lot of time on it uh, creating this. And we projected, uh, I and my, um, and my uh, uh, publishers projected that we would, by this time, three years later, we would be probably around 15% digital. Well, the first year we got up to around 4%. Uh, digital subscriptions. Um, it's cheaper for the publisher to be digital. It's very effective that you can do all kinds of things that you can't do on the printed page. The resolution of the photography is so beautiful. Uh, I, I was thrilled. I thought, oh boy, this is, this is the new frontier. Well, at the present time, we are about 3.9 percent digital in terms of subscribers. Um, and they, people don't want to pay online. They don't want to pay 9.99 or 29.99, whatever it is that whatever we, we were charging, they don't want to pay. They want everything free. It was we got off to the wrong on the wrong foot in the digital world, um, and uh, and a lot of big companies did that. They they didn't foresee the problems that the uh, that online would create for the printed word. Uh, so um, you can buy books so much cheaper than you can in the bookstore. You can access them so easily and uh, buy them, put, put them, uh, you know, upload them, get rid of them, delete them, whatever you want to do so quickly. It's all very different. But uh, that said, um, even though we're only 3.9% digital, we haven't lost a subscriber. So that's uh, a very good thing, <laughs> and uh, and I want to keep all our subscribers interested in the content. People still, I, I still have great faith in the human race. I think people still want to learn. They still want to cook. They still want to fix their homes up. They still want to garden, and they want to know how. And uh, that's what we're, our our job is. Great. I'm very interested in the economics of your magazine, and if you could say a few words about that and how that works, and how does that relate to the digital world as well? Well, right. since I started living, uh, we have uh, ventured out into other kinds of magazines, not only Martha Stewart Living and Weddings, we also started a Martha Stewart Baby magazine, which I adored. There just wasn't a large enough audience for Baby. We changed it to Martha Stewart Kids. Martha Stewart Kids, uh, we, that was in publication for maybe five or six years. A very, very good magazine. Uh, the content is very adaptable to online, so that's where it's all going. Uh, we also uh, purchased a magazine called Body and Soul, which we changed into a magazine called Whole Living. Whole Living, a uh, very, very popular magazine, but because of the advertising crunch, which came about four years ago, uh, to all magazines, uh, we shuttered that magazine, even though it had a million very avid subscribers, million. I was not happy closing that magazine. I had a board um, who um, I don't think really understood magazine publishing as well as they should have, um, but, and we weren't quite ready to put it all online. But it's still very excellent content, which we incorporate into the pages of Living Now. And we had a small digest size magazine, which was perfect for putting in your pocket, of uh, called Everyday Food, which became a very popular magazine, a circulation almost of a million also, uh, which we have online now and in video. So we've uh, successfully translated that into the new media. Um, but, but, it's, um, but all magazines are struggling in terms of how to um, encompass the costs of printing and paper and mail postage is very expensive. Those costs um, are, are just uh, sometimes just make, make a company struggle so much. And also uh, advertisers. Advertisers are confused about uh, where to put their money. Is it digital? Is it video? Is it um, online, offline? Is it in the printed page? Is it on TV? Uh, is it on cable? Um, they're, they're struggling. Right. And, um, and yet they're spending lots of money, but are they getting the eyeballs they want? Uh, it's not a sure thing any longer. It's a, it's a uh, really big, big challenge for all of us. 
Right. I, one thing I don't understand is that the conventional explanation of what's going on is that advertisers have stopped advertising in mass magazines the way they used to because of the web, and they all now go online. But at the same time, we're told that they pay less for advertising online than they did in the magazines. They must know, they must, even though there are more readers online, they must know something about the value of the printed magazine that we're not being told. So well, um, advertisers, um, as I say, they, they want to be where the eyeballs are. That's where they want to be. And uh, if you can deliver the eyeballs, uh, the clicks, um, and there's so many companies now counting the clicks. Uh, are you getting uh, a click on that ad as well as on the picture for the recipe next to it? Uh, it's very, very hard for us to to keep up with it. We were we were sailing along really well at the end of last year. Uh, we had uh, something like 21 million uniques for the December issue uh, in the December web on our website, and all of a sudden um, there was a big uh, drop in in um, in unique um, visitors because um, we don't know why. It just all of a sudden. But if you read the read the first quarter results of a lot of the companies, the Yahoo's, the AOL's, they're all experiencing exactly the same thing right now. They are all noticing that uh, there are a lot of problems with, uh, with uh, viewership. Right. So do you have a paywall on, on your online world? Do you charge for what people watch? Uh, we, only, only for the digital issues of the magazines. Uh, we have a, subscri a subscription rate, and, that's that, and we count those. It's very interesting because I don't know how many of the audience here was here the last two weeks. So not most of them because there were few, many fewer people here the last two Delacorte lectures. But one of them was by Jake Weisberg who runs Salon and gave the case for free online media. And the other was by Rick MacArthur who is the publisher of Harper's who, who doesn't believe you should give anything away free in terms of magazines because writers ought to be paid, et cetera. Do well, you come down on one side or the other on well, that? Well, as I said, original content, I think, is very valuable. And I think that the writers should, of course, have to be paid. That's their living. They are making a living by doing great research and great writing. Um, photography also should be paid for. Uh, a company like a Pinterest or an Instagram, they're just putting up anybody's pictures. Not The photographers aren't getting it. Their copyrighted pictures are everywhere. They're not getting credit for it. They're not getting paid. Right. So there's a lot of the Wild West out there right now. And yet, uh, somehow we've come around to thinking, gosh, if we're the most pinned magazine, uh, advertisers should pay us for that. So we're getting the money somehow maybe through advertising, through uh, native advertising, because the, the advertiser wants to be on the same near us, on, uh, on a Pinterest, for example, um, because uh, we're getting eyeballs. Okay. So it's very complicated. Yes. And no. every day I scratch my head, and every day I get explained by In Barbarak, who is my, my head of digital, and I sometimes don't even know what the heck she's talking about. <laughs> Should I invest in Martha Stewart Living if you would? At the present time? Yes. I probably, I, I, I probably if would I say. If I had the money. I, I would say yes, because our stock is not at the all-time low, but it's close to it. And I think that we have a, we have a, a very good future. Not I just got back. I, I, just a little aside, uh, Professor. Um, I just got back from China. I spent a, a most amazing week in Beijing and Guangzhou. And Guangzhou is the home of Alibaba. Alibaba is not at all interested in content, but Alibaba is really interested in the internet and on online sales. And I met with Jack Ma and his whole crew. One American, he's from Iowa. He was like sticking out like a sore thumb, very tall, handsome guy. Uh, they're, they're speaking Chinese in, in Guangzhou. It is a fascinating company. And China is so, it's us 30 years ago. It's America 30 years ago. And it is the land of, of opportunity. If you are um, an entrepreneur and you really are interested in, uh, in seeing a, the growth of a new middle class, that's where you can go. And, and probably as a journalist, too, uh, do very well. My guide was a young woman just out of Harvard, Chinese, but just out of Harvard. 
Um, and um, she had been um, brought up in Baltimore. Her parents were professors at the University of Maryland. But what a fabulous girl she was. And uh, the other guide was also a, a, an English-speaking Chinese uh, American educated young woman. But they're all flocking back to China to, to right, right. work. Well, there are a number of Chinese students at the school. It's very interesting to hear about what's going on there and what, how the new media, the digital world, is affecting their ability to censor. And at this point, we have one student who argues in our class that it's making it more diff difficult to censor what's going on right now. So. Well, I, I hope that um, censorship is lifted at some point. Uh, what, what they're censoring is some you know, American information um, but uh, but they can get it. Oh, my, my guide, I won't mention her name, uh, my guide knew exactly how to get around all of that. There are ways to get around it with special accounts and special ways into the, uh, into the forbidden internet. So it's, uh, it's interesting how they are accessing information. Well, you should, if you're willing to share that to the Columbia Journalism Review, <laughs> we'll publish an article on how to get around. I'll get her to come over. When she, she comes right. visiting here, she can come over and explain it to everyone. Okay. I'll tell her it's a good article. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, what about Columbia students who want to publish in Martha Stewart Living? Are you looking for students who want to publish in Martha Stewart Living? Can they do it? Well, um, we're, we're not, we don't accept just unsolicited uh, stories, and we never have, but uh, we are inspired by people's stories, and, um, and we are, or, or not, I shouldn't say they're, they're written stories, we don't, we don't uh, take their stories and then publish them uh, without authorship. Uh, we um, encourage internship, uh, we encourage uh, uh, people to join our, join our company. At, one time, I, I don't know if it's true right now, but we were the largest employer of Rhode Island School of Design graduates. Um, we um, also have a lot of um, uh, students from, um, from Parsons and, uh, and Pratt, um, mainly because we, we are a design company in addition to being a uh, media company. Uh, we have a lot of merchandising departments. But, uh, but we encourage people to come and uh, apply for jobs and, uh, and, and if, uh, you're interested in the in living and lifestyle. Uh, it's a, a good place to to uh, work. So, if a student wants to submit something, and I they have an idea for a story, what do they do to you? What do they, who do they talk to? Should they call you up? You have a number you want to share? Oh, with them? or <laughs> you know, you could you can work? you can work with Eric Pike. It's um, eight two seven eight thousand. Uh, he's our editor in chief, and Misha Haddad. Right who is our managing editor. And, um, and it's not, as, as I said, it's not, it's not that way. We don't, we don't really um, um, look for uh, outside journalists so much. We, we use freelance writers on specific stories that we create. Uh, pretty much every one of the stories that we create is, um, is created in-house. So that if we're doing a decorating story, we create the room, we create the whole ambiance of, of what we're, we're photographing. We work with a, um, a stable of fantastic photographers, and uh, we're very proud of the fact that our graphics and our, and our, um, and our photography has won many prizes, and, and, uh, and we have uh, sort of set a standard for all other magazines. Remember, this is 20-something you know, 20 years old, and, um, and we have been a prototype for many other uh, magazines that have followed, right. uh, and it's very successful magazines, Real Simple, Oprah, uh, Rachel Ray's magazine, a lot of uh, a lot of um, other kinds of lifestyle magazines. Great. Um, what's in what is in this issue? Everyone has one on their chair, and I have one. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But what what's in well, the this? Well, this we we uh, titled it our food issue. It has a very iconic picture on the cover of a of a raspberry blueberry float, and uh, it's all about food pretty much. And uh, even my column, and, and if you like fried chicken, uh, make my fried chicken recipe. It is a recipe I learned in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, one hot, hot summer night, I was down there um, giving a talk in Amarillo many years ago. And uh, it was, a, I think, a Thursday night. And all the cooks from all the ranches cooked together on Thursday nights. They all got together. They were given the night off to cook, and I happened to be invited to their dinner. 
and I learned how to make their fried chicken, which is the best fried chicken. And Lee Schrager, who just came out with a book called Fried and True, it's all about fried chicken. <laughs> he didn't put that recipe in, and he made a big mistake. So, uh, but it's good. It's uh, it's twice twice. Uh, it's soaked in um, in a salt brine first, and then in buttermilk, and then fried, and it is really good, delicious. Even my food editors were. I kept telling telling them how great it was, and they hadn't tasted it. When they tasted it, they agreed with me. That's a, that was a good thing. <laughs> they agreed. But it's all food. It's um it's uh, how to make uh, delicious summer pies. It's um, a food that would be appropriate for a picnic. And I'm getting hungry. I am, actually. Uh, it's uh, different kinds, different baking recipes. Um, there's, um, oh, I, I love the story on uh, this beautiful, um, fresh, simple Italian story that's uh, so evocative, and it's uh, the food is delectable, all kinds of bruschettas and things. So um, enjoy it, and please take it home and, and try to cook. Great. So this is a food issue, but you, you, you are in, the, you cook, you garden, you craft. You told me that you get up at five o'clock in the morning, which uh... I live on a farm. I live on a farm where I do all those right. things. You do all uh, that. So, yes. So how is this the magazine that you created different? How has it evolved over the years to be different from what your original idea was, or is it? Well, it's not so different. It's um, we we zeroed in on seven core content areas that have to do with living. And living to me is a limitless exercise, uh, and it can it's ever changing and ever interesting. So, um, so we we zeroed in on categories like uh, food, which is cooking, entertaining, collecting, uh, crafting, uh, gardening, um, decorating. Oh gosh, my decorating editor is right here, Kevin Sharkey. Good. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Um, and so those are the categories uh, that we, um, holidays, so holidays is a big, big deal for us. So, and, and so what we do is we create these stories. We are constantly, already we're thinking of my Halloween costume for this year, which is a, a big deal. It might not be to you guys, but Halloween is very big deal to many, many people in America. So uh, we create an amazing costume for me that, that you can actually make. Most of these costumes you can make. And uh, we have something special going on this year um, that I can't tell you about, but it's very exciting. And um, so we're already thinking about it. It has to be photographed because the cover is for October and it comes out in September. So I have to photograph it sometime during, um, during July. And the costume has to be made by, you know, by the beginning of July. So it goes on and on. It gets more and more complicated. I celebrate every holiday at least twice, mostly three times a year. Because we've already done Halloween and Thanksgiving. I mean, Thanksgiving's done for this year. And I, and, uh, but I eat lots of turkeys. And, uh, and do all these things. Great. So could you say a few words about, you do all this stuff, and obviously you're curious about everything, but what is, it, what is your role as the CEO of this company? How do you spend your day? You wake up at five, and I don't know, at five in the morning, I'm not sure what time no, you I like, like to I, sleep. No, I like getting, I've always been a morning person, okay. and I don't sleep a lot, so it's, uh, okay. so it's uh, read three newspapers a day. And, I, and I, we were just discussing while we were sitting over on the side there about newspapers, about news uh, in general, and how uh, I worry about uh, the dissemination of news to a lot of the younger people in the, in the United States, even in my office. Uh, you know, I, I, I reference a story that, that was in the paper yesterday. Nobody read it. Um, people are trying to get all their news online now, young, younger people, the, the tablet. The, I mean, the, the worst to me is the, is the, is the little mobile device, the, 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 your little telephone, your little uh, iPhone. Uh, to try to read a newspaper on that is really depressing to me because you miss a lot. You actually miss a lot. Uh, you can't read it all. Uh, I read three newspapers. I read the Wall Street Journal in the morning, I, and cover to cover, I'm in the car for an hour, so uh, I'm not driving. Um, and I, I read the newspaper, I, I'm listening to NPR, and I am uh, reading the New York Times and, and a tabloid, the name of which I will not mention. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm my, the, my hated newspaper, but I have to have it. 
So, um, so I read that, um, I tear, I, uh, we call them terrorists in our company because uh, many of us are terrorists. We tear things and show it to other people. Uh, but then we also email. I get maybe 200, 250 emails a day, which I have to deal with because they're not, they're not friends. I don't have any friends, by the way. I have only, <laughs> only be colleagues. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and even my friends have become colleagues because I, I, you kind of rope them all into your, into your existence. Um, and, um, and so then I, I get to the office. I'm not the CEO. I have a, I have a really uh, nice CEO, uh, Dan Deans. Um, and we work on all kinds of projects. We're, we're um, working on our international expansion right now. We have uh, magazines in uh, nine different countries, uh, and including Indonesia, um, in uh, Dubai, um, Turkey, uh, Germany, uh, all over the place, uh, various um, editions of our magazines. We um, also have our television programming in about 80 countries. Um, and I don't do a daily show now. I stopped my daily show a year and a half ago. I kind of miss it, but I also don't miss it. We do have two award-winning shows on PBS, and I like I like public television. Uh, WETA, W-E-T-A, is my is my station, and we are in 90% of the country. Uh, we just won the James Beard Award for our show uh, last Friday, and uh, I like doing how-to television in uh, in a good way where people can actually learn because I think I am a teacher. Right. So I'm spending my time teaching, still. Terrific. There are some openings for adjuncts at this school, if, if it interests you. Well, you never know. I mean, I, w I went to Barnard. Right. I hope you all know that. I went to Barnard College. I loved it. I took many courses here. I had a Carol right in uh, the library over here of my own, and uh, I, well, I adopted it. Um, and in those days, you could sort of do that. And I had a, a fabulous education here. Great. All right, I want to invite the rest of you to be part of this conversation. We have a microphone over there, and so you should go to the microphone, tell us who you are, and, and join in. And if there's a student in front of you, let the student be, or behind you, let the student ask the question if, it, if you're not a student, so. And if no one has a question, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> But anyway, so there's your first question. Hi. I'm a steward. Um, I'm an alumna. You can tell I'm not a student. I can. No, you, you <laughs> well, can be you a were. student at any age, right? This is true, a okay. lifetime student. Um, first of all, I love your products, even vicariously, even if I can't make most of that stuff. It's just fun to look at. Also, once I saw a picture of your prop department, or part of your prop department, which I thought was also totally amazing. Okay, but I want to I want to change this subject. There's a question I really want to ask you, and um, you don't have to answer, but it's it's off this track a little bit, um, and I'm not I'm not raising it to make you uncomfortable, but I wanted to ask you about uh, your experience in that facility, Alderson. I guess that's the name of it. I wanted to ask you, you know, from a social conscience perspective if you had any observations of, you know, the women there? The I, I spent five months in a place called Alderson in West Virginia. I, I haven't gone back to West Virginia. <laughs> I, I refuse to go to West Virginia. Um, but uh, it was a, a, an unpleasant interlude in a very good life. I learned a lot there, a lot that's wrong with this country. Uh, we are, That's what uh, I we, wanted to hear about. We, yeah, well, we are, and I haven't really had the time, or, nor the inclination, to spend a lot of time, you know, fighting for um, for um, closure of of prisons and and uh, in America. There's a lot of people in there that don't belong there at all. They, they are, there's no rehabilitation going on. So it was just a. Uh, I will write about it. I am. I've. I haven't started writing my autobiography, but it's kind of a fun autobiography, and um, and I think people will be interested in it. And this that that little per, that little um, interlude in my life actually will play a part in it. And it's uh, we 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 should be ashamed of what we do to a lot of people in this country. Yeah. You know, on another thank you. On another occasion, I have a theory that. Part of the reason that you were singled out is because you're a woman, and there are a lot of men on Wall Street who do 
what you were accused of doing. But, well. but having said that, we're here to talk about magazines tonight. Yes. <laughs> People are free to ask whatever they want. And the penal Martha system is, is another time. Okay, good. So, so. I'm sorry. I, this is directly related to what you just said, Victor. So, um, but I, I mean, just on that note, and it has to, a lot of us are going to be journalists in oh, two or three weeks, and many of us are female. And I'm just wondering, looking back now, your grandmother, you went to Barnard, um, and you know what a lot of people, what some people call insider trading, I think is probably just trading. And do you think about what happened um, to you? Happened to you because you are a woman, and I'm wondering. I had I, I, yeah. what happened to me is a is a, is a series of um, of unfortunate uh, events: uh, bad lawyers, bad advice, um, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, all kinds of things like that. No, ex I'm not making any excuses. It wasn't insider trading. Uh, it was when you read about it, and I and I have I've been silent about it because I had a company with fantastic employees and a really great brand to protect, and I could have spent a lot of years just complaining and whining and kvetching, and I would much rather have done what I did, which was just get it over with and tell the story at a time when it will make a difference, and I, it will make a difference. Great. The person who asked that question is teacher at Fieldston High School, who's a great student here, so. Great. No, that's good. Thank you. Hi, Martha. Um, hi. Hi, I'm a current Barnard student, so it's always lovely to see great and accomplished alumni like yourself come to speak. Um, and I'm also on a publication here at the school. So I'm just wondering if you had any advice for young women looking into the journalism field and you know how they can use their gender to an advantage or to overcome any boundaries. Well, there's so much, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the world of journalism, uh, but it's different. I mean, you're not going to go working in a, in a newsroom, probably, um, in just a, in, the, in the traditional newsroom. Uh, there's so much going on online. There are many uh, very interesting uh, agencies that are popping up here and there. Uh, there's a lot of things going on on television that need good reporting and good uh, investigative kinds of reporters and, and uh, journalists. Um, it's, it's what you're interested in and you have to sort of like find that place. It's, I'm sure it's competitive, uh, but, um, but they are, everybody's looking for the next good writers, the next good uh, journalists. I know they are. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jenna Dagenhart, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. I'm a current uh, Columbia journalism student, and I'm in the first ever food reporting class that we've had here. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, and if you'd like to check it out, it's called New York Table. I will. Um, but we use food as a lens to examine other topics, uh, politics, uh, the economy, poverty, everything. But um, in one of the first things that we did in this class was define one of our aha moments with food. And very simple question, but I'm just wondering if you ever had an aha moment with food. Oh. Uh, well, you've probably had many. But. Oh, I have. I, I've had a lot. I think, I think just sitting at my, my family's table was a, an aha moment, uh, which was uh, celebratory and delicious and fresh and from the garden. Uh, those are the kinds of things I remember from growing up. Uh, no cans were opened. You know, no bottles were opened except maybe wine for my father, and, uh, beer, but um, but and I still live like that. Very, I, I don't I don't open cans and um, very few boxes um, because it's um, it's more more about healthy, delicious, homemade uh, from the from the garden, from the farm, uh, from the local places. Um, that's how I like to eat, and uh, and I've been able to do that. But, um, but those are the, the, I think it was the family table that really got me interested in good food and, uh, and, investi and investigating the food of other countries. And the other, the other one was when I walked into, a, into the Cordon Bleu in Paris. I was on my honeymoon and it was uh, the year that Julia Child and her three other co-authors came out with Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And there it was in English sitting on the counter and I picked it up and looked at it and I bought it there in Paris. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, this is a great thing. So I was the original Julie. I should have <laughs> should have done it then. I, but I did. I cooked every single recipe in that first volume and then in the second volume. And that's sort of how I taught myself how to cook. Uh, and it was, it was French food, but it, that's not the point of it. The point is I learned a step-by-step -step method that really has, has evolved into the kinds of great recipes that we do in this magazine. Mm -hmm. So an aha fun. learning moment. Yes, it was really great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Martha. Hi. I'm Amanda Michaelberg. I've worked in a few newsrooms, and I know how difficult it is to get the circulation up to a million, if not more. How did the board justify to you that they wanted to close Whole Living? Oh, um, well, it was economic. It was totally economic. And, um, and I, I, what, I, what made me really saddest was we had really great editors and really, really great reporting and wonderful art direction. And, um, and I, I, tr I tried, and I probably didn't try hard enough personally. Uh, and, and, you know, I took it to a, a store called Whole Foods. Do you know that store? Um, Whole Living, Whole Foods. It made such sense to me. And they don't have a magazine. Uh, and they were just, eh, you know, they didn't, they didn't want it. They should have. They should have let us publish it for them. Because you know now yesterday yesterday they had a, a disastrous day Whole Foods because they're they're not they're not listening to their their customers you have to listen to the customers they want that kind of information they don't want to overpay customers will if you're if the the if the can no they don't sell so many cans of soup but they do sell some cans but if the oranges are you know, 50 cents higher for a dozen oranges at Whole Foods than the, than the grocery store next door. They're going to go next door. And you have to really pay attention to that. But, but um, it's, it's hard to, to shutter something that, that a million people, um, and more than a million because there were a lot more multiple readers, uh, really loved. But that content, as I said, is, uh, is appearing more and more, that kind of content, in here and online. Do you think you might bring it back? No, no. In another no, I don't know. But maybe. Thanks. Great. Hello. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming. Um, it's been really fascinating listening to you. And um, I think for me, what resonates so much, why I love reading all that you do, is that I can imagine you not only doing all these things, but that you really know how to do them. And that I love that you teach people. Well, I think that, that, that authenticity managed uh, to, it helped a lot. Yes, absolutely. What I wanted to know is, did you ever think you would be in this position of really teaching people things that somehow their grandmothers or aunts or neighbors or our church potluck suppers or synagogues are not doing for us anymore? And what do you think this says about us that we need to come to you to learn these things? Well, I'm your mom. <laughs> I mean, I consider I consider me the a, a mother of of uh, a lot of, of a lot of readers because mothers when they went to work in the starting in the 50s, 60s, 70s when they left home and went to work, my mother did it. She left six kids to go back to teaching, but she left when they were when the youngest was five. When she, then when that Laura, my sister Laura, was in school full time, my mother went back to full time teaching. Uh, but they mothers then forgot to tell their kids to brush their teeth. The incidence of tooth decay shot up when mothers went back to work because they weren't watching what their kids were eating, drinking, and not brushing their teeth. My brother's a dentist. He's filled me in on all these facts. <laughs> it's horrifying to me. But, uh, but they forgot to teach their kids all kinds of things. So tr I'm a big traditionalist. I love to to teach traditional things, traditional things with a twist. Um, we, that's why holidays mean so much to me. Um, I taught my daughter all those things. Um, and she is now cooking for five people, three meals a day at home, uh, raising two new babies and having, uh, I think, kind of a good time at it. But she is good at it. And she knows how to keep a house. She knows how to, you know, it's, it's important up to a point. It's not all important. It's not the only thing we have to know as mothers, as, as homemakers, but it's important. And, um, 
and to raise it to a, a level that makes you um, enjoy it and to feel good about it and to be complimented for your efforts, that's also important to me. So it's, it's all kind of a, a vicious cycle, but it's a, a happy thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Stewart, my name is Olivia Feld. I'm a British foreign student at the current class ah, at Columbia hi. Graduate School of Journalism. Real pleasure to hear you talk tonight. Thank you so much for making time to come and address the crowd. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, your story really strikes me as one of survival, and you've done so many things, um, made mistakes on the road, as all of us do. I'm really keen to know from you, what's your biggest lesson that you've learned in your life so far? Um, well, that having good ideas is not enough. Uh, making those good ideas happen is really the, 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 the challenge. Um, and figuring out how to make those ideas happen is the challenge. I'm still faced with challenges every day. I think I, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I like challenges. Um, I think I like uh, a struggle up to a point. I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a little crabby about struggling. I don't want to struggle anymore. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but I do think that um, that you learn how to deal with all kinds of people, all kinds of uh, of challenges, all kinds of um, of um, events in a very good way when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's an interesting life. So. But you've made a business out of domestic skills that no one had ever done before. Well, yeah, that's, we that's paved we paved the way. I, we question. created we created a genre of business that uh, that other people have entered successfully and thrived in. Um, and I'm part of a whole movement uh, in America that of food. I mean, I'm very happy to be in that movement. Uh, food um, when I was when I was growing up was mediocre. Uh, the way, uh, you know, not everybody's food at their, on their table was mediocre, but I mean, the whole idea of it, there, nobody ate Japanese food. But when I was in college here, there was a little tiny Japanese restaurant on Amsterdam called Aki. Uh, you, is it still there? I think it, it might still be there. Um, upstairs. There are a lot of good Japanese yeah. restaurants. Mm -hmm. in and the I though. ate there as much as I could. They played Japanese music. It was so exotic. And I loved it. And then I went to Japan and I loved it even more. Those are the kinds of things that have happened. The, 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 the uh, world is flat kind of thing that's happened in food, for, especially for America. We have really adopted uh, so many different cuisines into our everyday eating habits. And, and we've learned so much. Uh, to have a chipotle with Mexican food, you know, being a tremendously successful uh, company, how great that is! That uh, that that you know, up in North Dakota, you're you're eating good Mexican food. So it's it's um, I, I'm so happy to have been part of all of all of this these movements, um, and food lifestyle, uh, gardening, gardening. The, that's the fastest growing outdoor activity in in the United States right now. Gardening, how great! And, uh, and the whole interest in, in organic and sustainable. Uh, go see this new movie. Um, it, it, was, it was Food, Inc. And now it is, there's a new movie called Fed Up. Just go see that movie. That'll set you, that'll set you thinking about the next generation of what's going to go on in food here in the country. Thank you. When you're ready to write the book, I really look forward to reading it. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Frida Campbell Brogan, and I'm not really affiliated with Columbia, but Thank I was you. excited to be able to come here because I loved you on Fashion Police. So ah. <laughs> it's great to be able to ask you a question. I didn't um, see it. Was it good? It was so uh, good. Oh, I, good. <laughs> I, have a whole, I have a whole other level of respect for you, and I absolutely love it. Um, I wanted to ask Dealing you. Dealing with Joan Rivers and her <laughs> daughter. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, interested yeah. to see how that was going to happen, but her <laughs> being so off kilter and you being so straight laced. It was good, though. It was really good. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, apps and their place right now in uh, magazine, magazine publishing. You guys have uh, a couple of apps, one of which I'm a fan of, which is Martha 
Stuart Cocktails. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know it's about that time of day, right? It is about that time. It's past. It's a few hours past that time of day, actually. But I wanted to ask you uh, if you guys are thinking about um, uh, creating other, any other new apps around uh, niche, in, niche interests of your readers, and what place do you think that um, uh, apps have in the kind of next generation of magazine publications? Well, I think apps. Everybody wanted apps. Okay, this was again two years ago. Um, apps started to appear at a fast rate, millions of apps appeared. So many uh, interesting apps. Uh, and I'm still amazed at how, um, how excellent some of them are. But who has the time to be dealing with millions of different apps? You have to really sort of find the ones that are in your um, interest, in your wheelhouse. You have to try them. You have to see if they're really good or not, how limiting they are or how, how expansive they are. Um, we, we, did a, we did a cookie app, which was uh, kind of breakthrough. We did a cupcake app. We did a um, cocktails app. We did a craft app that is really good. The craft app uh, g uh, got the attention of Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard came in to see us, uh, I think it was yesterday, yeah, yesterday, with a brand new fascinating invention they have. Um, the next generation of PC, kind of. Wait till you see it. It's it's amazing. It's you'll you'll all be getting these, um, um, and it's it's wonderful. But they came because of that that app. Mm -hmm. So as a as a business tool, as a as a uh, sort of a lure for other kinds of businesses, these apps can be very very good for you. Um, you know, I use I use about maybe thirty apps uh, all the time, and that's you know from GPS to uh, freeflashlight.com or something, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know you, there are those apps that you have to have, and and I, I have to have my Scrabble. If I didn't have my Scrabble, I would go nuts sometimes on an yeah. airplane, or you know you have to have all that. So um, so it's it's if you have a great great idea for an app, work on it. It's they're not hard to make now, yeah. except for something like the Craft app. The Craft app is really complicated. Yeah. As a designer, I'd be interested to see what other type of uh, design apps you'd be interested in uh, building up, I'd, I'd purchase it. So just, oh, okay. just food for thought. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hope King. I'm a student here at Columbia Journalism School. I have two questions, and hopefully they're interesting enough um, to warrant them. But my first question is a little bit uh, different. What's your opinion of Sheryl Sandberg and the Lean In movement? And my second question is, as you're launching these magazines in different countries, what's the one common theme that works across all of them, or okay. all the countries? Well, second first, um, uh, the, the common thing that works is beauty. Um, beautiful photography, evocative uh, images. Uh, that really works very, very well. And good information that is kind of universally desirable. Um, that's that is, and when you look at my, I, I just got the, um, I think it was the Indonesian edition of Martha Stewart Living yesterday. On the cover is a picture of me with my granddaughter Jude in her playroom. That's on the cover of an Indonesian magazine. It couldn't be more American image, uh, with a little little baby, you know, playing with some toy in a beautiful playroom. But it's it fits Indonesia. They they need great. Uh, educational uh, toys for their kids, too. And these toys are universally available that, that are in the, in the baby's room. So it was, it's, and she loved seeing herself on, on this magazine. She went through the page by page. I showed it to her. Uh, she's three. Uh, she loves magazines, and she knows exactly how to turn the page. But um, she's, the next, she's the next Martha, I hope. But, uh, but and, and now as far as Sher uh, Sheryl Sandberg, um, I think Cheryl, with her amazing um, uh, education, her um, interest in economics, and her interest in, uh, in um, well, in politics, uh, she should really go into politics. I think she's done an amazing job at Facebook. Uh, she's been given a lot of leeway to do other things. And she's, uh, she's one person, one woman, who's been really um, uh, mobile in the very, very good way, and from job to job. And I think she's amazing. Would the Martha Brand ever go into kind of career you know, advice, that type of content in your magazines? Um, we, we do that on the radio sometimes. And we, we, like to, we like doing that. That's fun. OK, thank you. Yeah. Good. And the Indonesian edition, how much of 
what they publish is original with them it's and about, how much is from oh, It's about 60% Mar Martha and 40% uh, Indonesian. Right. But it fits so well, that, and they do a whole different layout. They right. do very beautiful paper and printing. We, we can't afford it here, but they can somehow. It's all printed in, in uh, Asia, and it's, they're beautiful editions. And do you have, for the editions around the world, the others, are they allowed to do 90% original material? No, we have contracts with them, and, contracts. and they and they're so generally right. they're generally more uh, more than 50% Martha and uh, and less of the of the country. Good. But that's what they're paying for, and that's what they're yes. looking for, well, like because that. they don't have the ability to to create uh, what we've created for these pages. So right. it's a it's a, a it's a good way to uh, extend the brand elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Good. Hi, Martha. Hi. Um, thank you for coming today. My name is Mary, and I'm a student here and a former Rhode Island School of Design grad. And uh, my question to you is, is that a lot of people who set out to do what you do, um, sometimes they try something and it doesn't always work the first time. And then sometimes they have to try something 100 times before they actually get to the point that they want to get to. Um, what has been your biggest challenge that you've tried a hundred million times, and you finally got to where you where you wanted to get to, and how did you do it? I don't have patience for a hundred million times <laughs> <laughs> at all, um, and and it's it's important when you're when you have an idea that you really want to happen is to find other people that are like-minded and will help you make it happen. Uh, and sometimes it happens really well, and then it doesn't work out. Uh, it was a good idea, but maybe your partner isn't the right partner for that idea, and you can't do anything about it. You just have to move on. So you have to know when to when to really, really, really ex expend your energies on that on that project, and when not to continue. It happens. All business is like that. Okay. Thank you. But a hundred million times, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Martha. <laughs> um, my name is Alex Pisty, and I'm a really great admirer of you. And I'm also a neighbor. And I actually I went to Wellesley, and at Wellesley I wrote a paper about um, the reaction of the town when you came to Katona when you first moved. You did? Oh, send it to me. I oh. want that for my book. I will. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, and I was wondering if, and I thought it was just really interesting, like the reaction of the town when you came and you tried to copyright Katona to make a line of home furnishings. And I was wondering. Um, name. I was naming a, a line. We had already made it, but we were trying to name it Katona. Right. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it was. There the were, uproar. Yes, which is what my paper was on. There were bumper stickers and protest songs. And I think it was just really interesting because it interfered with how Katona wanted to see itself as a town. And look at it. Look at Katona. Poor yes. Katona. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I was wondering whether you I have no hard feelings. I mean, it's it's just you know you you have to take all this crap and uh, you know if you're a celebrity of sorts. I don't even consider myself a celebrity, but if you consider you know if you are if you are in the public eye and and there's uh, and there's uh, an opposition, you just have to go with it. I mean, it's just. I had to I had to dig my stable. Did you talk about my stable? I I'm a equestrian actually. Oh okay. Well my <laughs> my stable. I, I was I designed this most beautiful stable. I'd never had horses. I wanted to have a nice house for them. And so the, this the zoning laws, correct? No, not zoning. The neighbor didn't oh. want to see my stable, so I had to dig a great big hole like 14 feet below grade to put my stable down in a hole, uh, which looks okay now, by the way. It but looks um, but. I had to do that because she she really opposed my stable, and now you know now I see her standing on the trying to see my stable <laughs> like that. Oh, so annoying. <laughs> um, I love Katona, but I have very mixed feelings. I've lived there my whole life. No, it's a very it's a lovely town. It's, it's where I shop. Yes, um, I try. My question was whether you felt like a welcomed member of the community now and also what your favorite places are in Katona besides your oh, home? Oh, in Katona itself. <laughs> well, I think my, my address is Katona. Yes. So um, my favorite place in Katona, uh, probably Scaglio's. That's the local grocery store where, where uh, I buy my meat and my, and my uh, basic groceries. It's very expensive, but, uh, but I go there anyway because I want to support it. And Mrs. Green's. 
which is the local organic market, and the, oh, the cleaners are the best cleaners, <laughs> uh, the Katona cleaners, you know where they are across from Kellogg's. Um, <laughs> I know the town, and, and the people, and we, we use the train, you know, lots, lots of people work for me use the train, so we pick them up at the train, and um, it, ne it, needs, it needs some help, Katona. It does. Well, I hope you feel at home there. <laughs> the <laughs> library is nice. It, it's a beautiful library. Yes. Really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Kelly Farmer. I'm not a journalism student, but I do admire your work. Um, you. And I guess I have long wondered the answer to this question. Which is, you said earlier when you're speaking about living to me is a limitless exercise, or um, I feel the same way, and I have for a very long time enjoyed cooking as an outlet, and I'm a veterinarian, I have a daughter, my husband travels for work, it's busy, busy. And uh, I just wondered, what do you do to relax? And it's a bit of a personal question, I guess, or, or should I say, do you ever just disengage and do something just to? No. No. Okay. I no, thought no. it might be no. No. Yeah. I, I just don't. I don't relax. I don't like sitting. Me I, I, I like doing. Yeah. And so um, you know, I, it's it's always doing something. If you know, if I have nothing else to do, I'll go into the greenhouse and get lost in there pruning. And mm -hmm. I have four big greenhouses, mm -hmm. and uh, and they need work all the time. All the plants need attention. Mm -hmm. I walk the dogs, you know, I go pet the donkeys, and, you know, feed the chickens, do, do something. There's a lot to do. That's and, I and, uh, and I have a And I have a lot to, a lot of, and, and it's great thinking time, mm -hmm. great thinking time to prune trees. Mm -hmm. Clean nice. the stables. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Muck the stalls. Right. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Play with the babies. I, 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 my whole life has been turned upside down because of the arrival of these two grandchildren. That's really, that's really where I want to be all the time is with them because they're just a clean slate. You can really teach those kids and they're good learners. Hi, my name is Alex Mentel. I'm at the journalism school as well um, and I'm a Polish American like you. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood making your recipes and your mother's recipes um, with my grandmother. I just had, you know, made a babka the other day. And I was wondering if you were ever thought about um, making your own Polish cookbook. Um, we've incorporated a lot of Polish cooking in, in the magazine. Um, and I have my mother's recipes. They're not my recipes. So um, we're, we're releasing her 40 recipes um, for Mother's Day. I, I think oh. they're on American Maid. I think we have a store on eBay called American Made, and I think we're selling my mother's, um, uh, it's a DVD of her recipes, of all the things that she did on my show. So uh, not, not really my own. Thank you. Hi, Martha. Thank you so, so much for Hi. being here today. Thank you. So um, your being here is particularly exciting for me because I'm not just a Columbia undergrad who's about to graduate. I am also uh, fulfilling the end of my internship at Martha Stewart Living right ah, now. Hi. So, <laughs> hi. So it's really wonderful to get a chance Which to... Which department are you in? I'm in editorial. Oh, you are? Okay. Yes, and Good. it's been wonderful. Um, and I'm actually wondering, how do you prioritize and how do you lead such a full life? Because I, just like you, I have a lot of different hobbies and interests. And I want to be able to work at a magazine, but also pursue all those other things that I love to do with equal fervor. And so I'm wondering, how do you, um, how do you pick and choose? And do you ever have huh. to say no to things that you love? Uh, yeah, you do have to say no to certain things. And you have to just, I mean, it's, it's, there's no rest. I mean, you just can't, you know, like that question about what do I do to relax? It's, it's not about relaxing. It's about, it's about doing and choosing what you'd like to do and spending the time. I mean, I love going out to eat because I like to taste other people's food. I like to go to restaurants. Um, I'm gonna go to a restaurant after this, I hope, <laughs> and uh, eat something, starving. Um, but um, but you, just, you just have to organize your time. It's hard and it's more difficult now than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. And I really think uh, and I, I'm going to write about this too at some point. It's about the the internet, 
that internet is taking up a lot of time. I used to think, gosh, the internet is going to save me so much time that it'll make, me, make time for other things. In fact, that's not what happens. Because the first thing you do, where do you go when you get up in the morning? You go to that stupid iPad. Mm -hmm. Or you go down to your computer in the kitchen. You know, and the dogs are waiting, looking at me. What the heck are you doing, Martha? <laughs> I want to go outside. And you know, I have to check my email. You don't have to check your email. So you have to really, really make a habit of, of how much time you spend where. And then, uh, and then sort of dole out your interests. Great. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Martha. Hi. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm another RISD alum and a textile designer here in the city. And I have often noticed over the years of reading your print magazine that you don't often cover the topic of personal finance. And I found that so interesting because I think uh, for a lot of us, money is a, a defining factor of how we live. So can you maybe speak to the Well, reason why? we've talked about it and talked about it. And, uh, and I have been approached by insurance companies and uh, a bank uh, to, to do more finance in our magazines. Uh, when we had the 24-hour-a-day radio station on Sirius, we only have a four-hour-a-day radio now on Sirius, uh, we did cover more uh, financial uh, advice mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and could interview. But it's just, it's just a priority. I mean, it's just, I, we should. I, I agree with you, we should. And I think women need it. Mm. Um, and not just women, but, uh, but homemakers need it. Right. Um, and uh, maybe it's time for it sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Verena. I'm also not a student here. And um, it's kind of in connection to two, the two previous questions. Um, I was wondering whether you ever thought about opening your own restaurant. I was reading that you had a catering business to start off. And so I was wondering if you ever thought about either opening your own or investing in one? Oh, well, we're, we are opening something like a restaurant. It's not quite. It's a, it's a um, coffee shop. And now there's lots of coffee shops being opened. But we have the opportunity to do one in an in a appropriate place. And uh, I'm working on the design right now. And, um, and I, I, it's just for, it's not a lark exactly because it's an investment. But, but um, I'm anxious to see how it turns out. I love a good cup of cappuccino, which is very, very hard to find. And I am going to be selling that good cup of cappuccino, <laughs> plus other things, but not, not too many other things. Okay. Thank so you. that'll be, that'll be um, soon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Helen. Um, I'm wondering your view on um, genetically modified food. What my attitude is towards it? Yeah. Um, well, um, it depends on which food it is, and it depends on, uh, on if I have an alternative. Uh, I grow a lot of old varieties, unaltered, uh, non-hybrid uh, varieties of vegetables. Uh, I have a vegetable greenhouse where I grow everything I eat on a daily basis, and it's all year round. I have tomatoes right now, and I have, I have beets, and I'm having a lunch tomorrow of everything from the greenhouse, which is so delightful, but no GMOs, and it's um, uh, GM, uh, g genetically modified foods. I worry about um, the advent of all the, the problems that children are having, uh, the, the huge amount of gluten intolerance that's appearing, the peanut allergies. When I was growing up, nobody had a peanut allergy. Nobody in my whole school. I don't remember anybody saying they were allergic to peanut butter. And, uh, and now it's just prevalent. So um, I think it all has to do with, uh, with not only um, modifying foods, but also the way that they are treated in the ground and do the way you, that they are processed sorry, uh, when do they... Do you feel like it's your responsibility to advocate for or against? Oh, we, we do. We do. Oh, yeah. Okay. We do. We're, we're very much uh, against factory farming. We're very much against um, a, lot of, uh, the, a lot of other things that go on in the food industry. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leslie. This is more of a personal question, but um, how do you keep balance as even well, as a working mother and grandmother, and how do you stress management, handle stress management? Is there certain rituals or certain things daily that you? 
I'm not good at I'm not good at um, at uh, meditation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a terrible, or a terrible. But I I I I work out. Exercise is really important for stress management. Uh, very important. Uh, yoga is really good for that. Um, as is as is just going to spin class or something. Uh, you you have to do that um, and. Balance is hard. Uh, I'm I'm always I, when a when a young woman in my company comes and says, "Oh, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a baby yeah. in six months." Uh, I've already know it. By the way, I can see. Uh, <laughs> I'm very I'm very good at knowing who's pregnant and who's not, and they don't want to tell me you know, for a while. But um, but you always know who's going to come back to work and who's not going to come back to work because they can't manage. I mean, it's very hard. Yeah. Uh, to be a mother, a wife, a breadwinner, and uh, and a, 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 you know, just hard. So what is your and, secret? <laughs> oh, well, I failed. I, I got a divorce after 27 years. No. I didn't balance that well. Well, no, uh, the, the husband it was, part. You know, and, and that's part of it. I mean, if I were still married, you know, I'd, I'd probably have my 50th wedding anniversary <laughs> or something by now. Um, it didn't work. Um, because uh, it was there was a little bit too much time away from the marriage, I guess. But um, but that said, I don't miss him. Um, I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just um, I just think it's hard, and you have to. It's it's in you as an individual to try to figure out a balance that works for you. And is there any advice you give advice to everyone, but advice that you give? To your daughter, that's you know, or anything. She's divorced rest, too. Rest, a no, mother without a, a mother without a husband, <laughs> and uh, and luckily she's a, she's allowed the sperm donor father to come enter into the family now, and he's now he's not her boyfriend or lover, uh, but he is the father of the children, and he's fabulous, and now the children have a father. It's the modern family. Yeah. All I can I keep saying to myself, the modern family. And it's very, very different than the way it was when I was growing up. And, and you just have to adapt to it. It's like, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> right? Isn't it? Yeah. Hi, my name is Caroline. I'm a student here at the Journalism School. I don't want about reading about all of this in the Columbia <laughs> newspaper, please. Yes. Um, so I remember a few years ago, I ended up watch, like binge watching a few of your daughter's uh, episodes of her TV show. And I was wondering what you thought uh, of her show, Whatever Martha, and also of her sort of commenting so openly on your relationship and your career. Uh, I thought it was very funny. It was my idea. <laughs> and I, I, th I thought it was a hysterical show. And she actually just got bored with her partner on the show and her... And the, and she and she wanted to have babies, so she was working really hard on babies at that time. So, so um, who knows where she will reemerge? But she she will one of these days. Um, but uh, I liked it. I thought it was very funny. And and you can t you you can take yourself really really serious, or you can have a sense of humor about what you do. And I try to do the latter. Thank you. All right. Hi Martha, I'm Corina. I'm your last question. After that, you can go eat. So oh, I'll be quick. <laughs> Perfect timing. Perfect. Thank schedule. you. So I have sort of part one, part two question. At the beginning, you said that internet is good, but it's also a competition. And Warren Buffett kind of said something stayed with me. It's like he was born at the right time. Right now, if you look back, if you were to start your company right now, what would be your sense in how you would create your brand at this competition at this moment. And the second question is, internet is good to promote yourself, but it's harder to create a, the amount of success with TV show, magazine, and everything that you've done. What would be your advice for new people starting nowadays? Um, well, it's, it's very complicated because the internet is, uh, is, a, is still an uncharted territory. We don't know where it's going even now. I mean, it is, the monster is Google in America. That is the monster. That is a fantastic company. Are they going to start getting interested in their content? I don't know. I mean, I'd like to know. If they were, I would, would I be working at Google and making content for Google? Um, and um, am I interested in what Amazon is doing? Sort of, but not 100%. Not 
Uh, am I interested just in online selling? Not not 100 percent, but it's very good to be there in that marketplace. Uh, we haven't even talked about any of the merchandising that we do and the partners that I have, all of them struggling with the threat of an Amazon and an Alibaba coming in. Uh, we, we always say that our media leads and our merchandising follows because those dreamers that we have that love to dream about everything in the magazine don't necessarily do it all, so they have to buy it all. And then there's the doers that do it all, and they don't have to have all the product as, as much as, uh, as the dreamers have to have. So it's, it's complicated. Um, it, it would be, it's hard to say. I, I would, that's another conversation about uh, what, what it would be like and how I would structure it today. Uh, it's very different. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, we had a record number of question, I know. Boy, questions this is great. tonight. Yeah, good you questions. didn't invade, you didn't evade any of them. I knew I was going to learn about cooking and gardening and magazines and the new media. I didn't think I'd learn about stables or the case for divorce. But I want to thank you anyway. This is great. Have a nice night and thanks very much.